Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. I'm so glad that you've decided to join with us. And I want you to know, whether you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, or ChristFC.org, we have a host that is on all those platforms and would love to engage with you. So leave a comment. Let's get the conversation going all throughout the service. Also, if you're new and if you've never clicked the New Here tab on ChristFC.org, please do that at some point during the service. We'd love to know that you're here and we have a gift that we'll send to you. Well, I can't believe that just last Sunday, uh, so many of us got to gather on the lawn while many of us still continue to watch online. And uh, you can see some of the footage right now. It was an amazing time. It was warm, but it was sunny, and we were so thankful. And I'll tell you, it was so nice just to see so many people and connect. Uh, but we know that for many of you, you were unable for different reasons to join with us, and we're glad that you're joining with us right here online. So we're going to jump into our time of singing right now. If you're new, uh, our song lyrics will be all at the bottom of the screen. So join me and the rest of the worship team inside the auditorium as we fix our eyes on the one who made us and gave his life for us. Well, good morning, CFC. You know, we are gathered all over the place today. Some of us are together, some of us are separate, some of us are together watching in living rooms. But no matter where we're at, we are coming together to lift up one name, one renown, and give glory to the one who can do the impossible. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing together. Just one word. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. Yes, it does. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that I God can do. Come on, say no mountain that he can move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that our god can do just one word you hear what's broken inside me just takes a word just one word and you revive every dream One touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that I God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that I God can do. There's nothing, there's nothing that I God can do. There's not a prison wall we can't break through. Oh, 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 praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that I God can do. Oh, oh. Lord, we believe you can do the impossible. I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power come on sing it out I will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of Jesus. let faith arise let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power come on sing it out i will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like his power there's nothing that i can get to oh not a mountain that 
praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing, there's nothing that Jesus can do. There's nothing that I God can do. There's not a prison wall we can't break through. But praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that Even though we're spread all out, we can come together. We can join together to get to declare praise to our God. We bless your name, Lord. A people come together, strange as neighbors, our blood is one. Children. Generations of every nation of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Is in his blood, Jesus, light of heaven, and Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Whoa, 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 whoa. Come on, let's sing together. Praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, every breath we breathe, repeat the sound. Always children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Come on, let's sing that again. A swing wide, all ye heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, every breath we breathe, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His 
Is in his blood, Jesus, light of heaven, Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Well, it is so good to kind of sing some songs to help us to kind of recenter and refocus on what life is really all about. Well, I'm actually standing in front of a place that normally, when we can meet all together, would be hopping with tons of kids. Uh, this is part of the kids' ministry, uh, kind of an indoor playground area that we have in our facility. Uh, and we want you to know, parents and kids, we miss you. Uh, Natalie and Lisa are doing an amazing job continuing kids ministry even virtually and as a matter of fact I want to turn it over to Natalie our kids men director uh, who wants to share an update with you. Good morning CFC. Well last weekend eight of our volunteers drove around the area and delivered packages to some of our CFC kids. If you didn't get one that means that we don't have your address. So to update it you can email us at kidmen at christfc.org so that your family won't miss out on our next mailing or porch delivery. You should also be receiving our weekly emails with resources like Bible lessons and discussion questions. If you're not getting them, then you can go to the church website and sign up under the Stay Connected tab. And make sure that you check your promotions tab as well. We just launched our That Seems Kind of Weird series. So kids, you should have received one of these in your porch drop-off over the weekend. You, if you turn it over, you can fill it out right here with your question, and we would love to answer you. Or you can email us at kidmen at christfc.org, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. We miss all of you guys so much, and we can't wait to see you. We hope you're having a great summer. Bye! Thanks, Natalie. Listen, make sure that you are connected and receiving our weekly newsletter that should be delivered in your inbox. Uh, you can do that by going to our website, ChristFC.org, and just click on the Connect tab uh, right on the homepage. Just scroll down and you'll see it. Make sure that you're getting that. And also, some people have said, I don't know if I'm still getting it. Check your promotions folder. Depending on how you have your inbox set up, it might be going there instead of your primary one. Uh, but it's going there if we actually have your email address. And speaking of email address, if you're new, we want to know that you're connecting with us. You know, we believe that uh, this is not a time where we're closed down. This is just a time we're pivoting and doing church a little bit differently. But we want to be more connected to our community, not less. And we want to know you're on the other side of that camera. And we have an actual gift that we would love to send you, just as our way of saying thank you for tuning in. So if you go to our website and you click on the New Here tab and just provide uh, your email address, and if you give a, a, your actual physical address, we will mail you the gift, uh, and we would just love to do that as our way of saying thank you. Well, I want to say that during this season, those of you that call CFC your home church, uh, you are making possible the good news of Jesus to go out into our community. You're making it possible for people inside the community of CFC to be well cared for and to be reminded that they are still on God's radar even in this crazy season. So I want to thank you for your generosity. I want to thank you for your faithfulness. And I want to remind you, everything that's worthwhile in this life, there's a price tag. There's a cost to it. And so we believe that the good news of Jesus is so worth it. It, it is costly. But I want to thank you for your willingness to sacrifice and partner with us and really step up, especially during these summer months, so that we can continue to have ministry go forth and do things like Natalie mentioned with our kids because it costs to do that. And you're making those things and so many other things possible. So as you're getting used to, uh, our time of worship in order we can give, we can do so on our website. You can do it through texting there. If you want to mail in a check, all of the information is provided at ChristFC.org under the Give tab. So I just want to take a moment and say thank you, and I want to pray and ask that God will continue to meet every need and to see this message of his son go forth. So pray with me. 
Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity that we can gather in all these unique ways. Thank you, Lord, for our partnership in the message of the gospel. And we pray, God, that you would continue to make your name known, both in our community and our neighborhoods, and yes, the nations. So we ask that you would use this time of giving to bring honor to your name and to do great good for other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to jump into our message as we continue in our series, so check it out. Good morning, everybody. I want to get right to it and just ask you the question that's, that's almost superhero status level. Have you been able, or I should say it like this, can you walk the tightrope between equally valid choices? And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean simply, um, can you hold two things that are virtually contradictory in tension? Classic example of that is the parent whose maybe adolescent son adult son that's returned home is on a self-destructive path, right? You want that child to know that you love them, that nobody is more in your corner than you, but you also passionately are diametrically opposed to the choices that they're making, right? If you emphasize the one, the love and the support, it might lead to enablement. If you emphasize the other, the kind of tough love, the, the enforcement, it might lead to abandonment where they cut and run. This morning, Jesus has a word to people that are feeling that pressure. Because if you want to follow Jesus in our culture, just as it was in the first century culture, there's always going to be other things that we hold in tension, right? We want jobs that are good. We'd like to get promoted in those jobs. We'd like to be thought well of by our neighbors. And we'd like to be serious about following Jesus. We'd like both things to be true. In fact, if you're watching this morning and you don't call yourself a Jesus follower, I'm just gonna lay it out for you. You might look at this message and say, hey, that's exactly why I don't want in. But don't check out too soon. I can encourage you. I was there, I know exactly what you're contemplating, exactly what you're thinking, I really do, and I empathize with you and I identify with you. But if you listen carefully to what Jesus says, some things are worth the tension. And that's his message to our third church today. I'll bring it up on the map because I know you're all excited. You'll see it. It's right here. We started in Ephesus, went about 40 miles up the road to Smyrna, and now we're going a few miles further up to Pergamum, here called Pergamos, an alternate spelling. But this was another prosperous city in the first century. They were chock full of wealth, business activity, and there were a lot of other things going on as well. But let's just get right to it and see what Jesus has to say to his church. We see it in this verse. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the, yikes, sharp, two-edged sword. Now, if I want to get your attention and I tell you, hey, I'm holding a sharp, two-edged sword, I bet that'll get your attention. It might not be the kind of attention you want to give, but I bet it's a a uh, kind of attention you will give at that point if you believe that I'm holding such a weapon. But we shouldn't be surprised. The weapon is not physical per se. We know that because a little bit later on in this passage, we'll see in verse 17, therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now we said in the first week, Revelation is called apocalyptic literature. That means, in that form of writing, symbols stand in for things we typically see so that we can see things at a deeper, more intimate level. Jesus doesn't have the hilt of a sword, you know, kind of clutched between his teeth. That would be ridiculous. It's a reference to his word. His word slices and dices. It cuts. We'll see that in a little bit. And Jesus needs a church that is having a hard time holding two things in tension to pay close attention to what he has to say. But even though he holds the sword, his heart is toward 
his church. You'll notice the note of empathy right out of the gate. Look what he says in the next verse. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Jesus is telling the church at Pergamum, guys, I know the environment you're in is hostile. I know that you're not in a conducive environment to spiritual growth, right? Um, you know, eventually, very, maybe very soon, the ballparks will be open in Major League Baseball. We're very close. We'll see. Uh, and maybe you and I eventually will get back to stadiums where we can cheer on teams again. But have you ever been in a stadium of your opponent? Anybody has ever gone over to Pittsburgh? Right? Anybody ever gone up to Yankee Stadium? Uh, you know, Steelers or Yankees? Do you wear your Orioles or your Ravens attire? Some of you do. I guarantee you, you know what hostility looks like. When you are trying to live out your fandom in an environment where it's not encouraged and supported. That's why sometimes I'm amazed. I'm just going to confess to you. People have come up to me after I've preached a sermon and they're like, Greg, man, that was really bold. And I'm trying to be a little more open and say, bold? Dude, I was preaching to the choir or the worship team, or I was preaching to my friends. I know the majority of people in our church gathering probably are already bought in to our mission to see people's lives changed by Jesus. So it's not hard when you're in a room of friends to thrive. It is hard when no one around you, it's not just that they don't care, but they may be actively working against you. Now notice Jesus says where Satan's throne is. <laughs> wow, that's strong language. There appears to be a reason that Jesus says that, that we can verify archeologically. Let me show you this picture of the Acropolis at Pergamum. Now that's just a remnant. This is a large hill that was about a thousand feet above sea level, so it was quite daunting and impressive. And you'll notice here these columns, you'll notice that these columns were the skeletons of various temples on this Acropolis, which is just a big hill. Now, if you want to know the gods and goddesses there, I put some information. If you're using the Bible app, you want to geek out, you'll learn a lot of cool stuff. I did in the past week. But what we need to know for our culture, we, we may not have an Acropolis, right? But we have a TV set. We may not have a hill of which there's many altars, but there are many, many uh, chat rooms available to us at our fingertips. Uh, there are many stores available to us, uh, you know, brick and mortar places where we can find things that compete for our allegiance. On this hill, this Acropolis, there were so many gods and goddesses, right? And you pick your poison, right? If, if you want to uh, just kind of have a state of mind-altered euphoria, Dionysus, right? The god of wine, really often called the god of drunkenness, could supply you with what you needed. If sexual satisfaction and pleasure was what you were in for, well, obviously Aphrodite was right there to offer you what you were looking for. But smack dab in the center of that, uh, those columns was an altar to the Dea Roma, which means Rome itself, the mighty empire of Rome, was worshipped like a god. In fact, most scholars think at the time Revelation was written, the emperor's name was Domitian. And Domitian was one of the few Caesars who demanded worship, not in memoriam, not in memory of him after he had died, but in that moment. So as long as you swore allegiance to Rome above all things, you could have whatever other religion you wanted. You could take Aphrodite. You could take Dionysus. You could, you, you could take whoever you wanted. If you wanted might and power, you could worship Zeus. If you wanted to be one of these weird Jesus people, you could worship him so long as it was subordinate to your allegiance to the great and mighty Rome. Now, there's an important kind of application we could make of that. I might put it like this. The world is fine with a private Christian experience. It really is, even to this day. It was in the first century, I think it is today. So long as it is subordinated to a greater allegiance to, and I'm leaving that blank on purpose. 
fill in the blank. That could be anything. It may be a greater allegiance to your job. And maybe you have a boss whose expectations are job first and everything else second. Your family, your religion, your hobbies, whatever. It may be an educational institution that you're a part of. It may be your perception of what they expect of you. Or it could legitimately be what they actually expect of you. People are fine with a personal, private Subjective Christian experience, so long as it's subordinated. So what the Christians at Pergamum were dealing with is universal. They wanted what all people wanted, right? They wanted family stability. They wanted economic stability. They probably wanted some degree of personal entertainment and enjoyment like we all want. And they wanted to follow Jesus. Here's the problem. What happens when allegiance to Jesus upsets the apple cart of those other commitments? Well, let's keep that in mind, and I think we can see why Jesus says what he says to the church. Let's look at the next verse. He says, you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Now, we really don't know a lot about Antipas. I wish I could tell you more. We have to take what Jesus says at his word here, that some years earlier, there was a faithful Jesus follower, a dude named Antipas, who apparently stood his ground so much and declared his allegiance to Jesus so much that the culture at Pergamum turned against him. And notice how Jesus doesn't pull any punches here. He minces no words. He tells us that the spiritual enemy of our souls, Satan himself, was active in the hostile culture at that time so much that Antipas died. But what does Jesus say? He says, church, you held fast. You didn't cave you didn't crumble. You didn't fold like a cheap suit. You didn't collapse like a house of cards. You held. That's, that's an amazing thought. I want to tell you something that I still do. This is just a tool that I'll invite you to consider. I periodically read a, a book. It's, it's kind of antiquated language. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, but check it out sometime. You don't even need to go to the library. You can get it online for free where it chronicles the stories of Jesus followers from the first century all the way through into what we would call kind of the post-Middle Age period. And you will find story after story after story. And it's baffling. And, and historians agree, they don't deny it, of people that were just subjected to miserable, torturous, unthinkable pain, suffering, and death. And they didn't recant and they didn't shrink back from their allegiance to Jesus. Now, it seems logical. If you want to stamp out the church, just start killing some of its visible leaders. Just start wiping out some of its most notable contributors, and they will be stamped out of existence. But you know what happened in the first century, which is why we're actually here today in 2020? These martyrs that would not bow the knee to something inferior to Jesus Christ, they, their deaths actually strengthened the church. They didn't make them shrink. An early church father named Tertullian, I, I, um, I always want to say turtle, Tertullian had this pithy saying, it's so profound, the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. Wow. The more you try to stamp it out, the more it actually emboldens people to believe. Can you imagine the thinking, man, I knew Antipas, I knew Polycarp, I knew those guys. They were sane people. They weren't kind of on some conspiracy theory trip. They weren't the weird guy. They were normal, everyday people, but they were convinced that this Jesus was real, and they declared ultimate allegiance to him. And do you know what it actually did? It emboldened the faith of those who followed Jesus. Well, it'd be great to stop right there, wouldn't it, and say, man, there's the church at Pergamum. Now, that's what we had last week, the church at Smyrna. Jesus only had affirmation. This is more like the church at Ephesus. Do you remember week one where there's a mixed bag? There is commendation, but there's also critique. 
Jesus does have some critique. Let's see that in verse 14. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. Now, there's a lot going on in this verse. And most scholars and commentators believe the next verse is just another group of false teachers that were, were in on this kind of destructive party. Uh, I'll bring it up to you, verse 15. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We actually saw that same group in week one with the church at Ephesus. So let me just step back. Again, if you're using the Bible app, I include a lot of links in the notes. Balaam was a false prophet. You can read about him in three chapters in the book of Numbers, 22 through 24. Balaam was hired by the Moabite king, an enemy nation of the people of Israel named Balak. It's confusing because the names are similar. And basically, Balak said, hey, I hate these Israelites. Uh, and I don't buy that they're God's people. So he was bringing opposition. God's people have always faced opposition. That's what we see in the book of Revelation. But I want you, this is what the king said to Balaam, I want you to cause them misery. So they tried and tried, and finally he used an age-old tactic. Let me, this is what Balaam did, get Israel, the men of Israel, enticed into sexual sin and we'll kind of mix it up with some cultic rituals and some worship of other gods, and it will weaken the people of Israel. And you know what? It did. So we don't know exactly what was going on, but we don't need to know exactly what was going on at Pergamum because we got enough right there. There were a group of phonies that wanted to come in and infiltrate the gathering of Jesus followers at Pergamum and get them tripped up. You know what a great way to trip up people is? Sexual sin. Now, I know whenever a preacher in a Christian church starts talking about this, people say, oh boy, here we go. Here comes the antiquated hellfire and brimstone. Here comes the, the Victorian sentiments about sexuality, etc. I understand that. I really do. And I understand why you're probably balking at that. But let me just ask you to hold on for a second. Because I bet you don't have to be a religious historian. You don't have to be a prude to know that sex is dangerous, right? Because you know somebody, or maybe you are that somebody, who has seen families, marriages, children destroyed. Why? Because one day or one night, one man thought, what if I step out of my current arrangement and I go exploring? right? I don't need to say any more than that. I know there's families watching at home. It's kind of self-explanatory. Notice I didn't use any religious phrases when I described that, did I? I didn't say fornication, right? I didn't even say adultery. I just described an everyday occurrence that any thinking man or woman knows has the power to destroy and emotionally, sometimes financially, ruin people's lives. If you can sign on to that much, you can understand what Jesus is saying to the church here. Now, if you're a person that's already committed to what Jesus says, you, you got just no doubt at all that a passage like Proverbs chapter 6, which I'll bring up now, uh, is uh, right on. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. And I have talked to people that have said, Greg, for one moment, one moment of forbidden fruit, pleasure, interest, curiosity, I, I ruined everything. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I've talked to people in my office, in coffee shops, at restaurants, in cars, on the phone. I, I've been doing this for almost 25 years, and I, it would be heartbreaking for me to tell you the stories detail by detail. But Jesus says, my followers at Pergamum, you are letting people entice you 
with an age-old bag of tricks that has been ruining people's lives forever. And this should not be in the church. Now, in the culture at Pergamum, it was encouraged. It was. The, the experts tell us this. The scholars tell us this. I mean, what you wanted to do, how you wanted to do it, with whom you wanted to do it, when you wanted to do it, go for it. And that's what all those gods and goddesses represent, don't they? I mean, Aphrodite, right? Pleasure, sexual pleasure. Yes, oh, you'll be so happy. You'll be so fulfilled. They just don't tell you about the shipwreck that's coming just beyond it, right? Oh, the drunkenness. It's going to feel great. You're going to be having a great time. You're going to be on cloud nine. But that next morning is coming, or in our culture, that short car ride home is about to end the lives of people that had no idea it was coming. The gods and goddesses of any age always overpromise and underdeliver, or they boldface lie and tell us it's going to be good. And Jesus is telling us, look at me, not at these gods and goddesses. They will not do for you what they promise. Only I will do for you what I promise. So when Jesus says he knows the culture they live, he knows how hostile it is, he is saying that because he understands the seductive and also simultaneously condemning culture in which Jesus' followers will always have to live. Have you ever noticed that our culture, right, our American culture doesn't sound a far cry from this culture in the first century of Pergamum, does it? But have you noticed that in our culture, just like it was then, as permissive as it seems, there's often ridicule if you stand against the current. Look what Peter wrote to the ancient church in the first century. Peter said they, and those in the context are those that are outside of the faith community, unbelievers, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living. They're surprised, but notice, they heap abuse on you. And I want you, I, I'm gonna say it, particularly if you're a younger person watching, you're, you're a preteen, you're a teen, you're a college student, maybe you're a grad student, you know you've already experienced it. Sometimes it's hard enough just to stand against the tide, but sometimes people will tell you that you are a jerk or a loser for standing against the tide. May I say to you, if that's your experience, you are experiencing something any real, authentic Jesus follower has experienced for 2,000 years. This is what Jesus calls us to. But let's see what he has to say to us in conclusion. Look at verse 16. It says, therefore, those of you that are caving, that are folding like a cheap suit, repent. And we keep seeing that word in these letters, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, I know that's harsh. That's not the Jesus meek and mild. That's not the, 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 the soft British accent Jesus we often see in movies about him. I understand that. But I'll tell you what, it's a real Jesus who hates that which threatens to destroy us. Repentance just means, as we've seen in the series, change your mind. It, it's not some elaborate ritual. It just means, Jesus, I acknowledge the path I'm going down is destructive, and I agree. That's what repentance is. I agree with you that when you say this is bad for me, I'm going to accept your diagnosis above anyone else's. And we turn to him. And when Jesus promises judgment, he's not even here talking about judgment on the world. He's talking about bringing his decisive, fierce word of critique and judgment to his own people, the church. But that's what true love does. Do you realize true love always has hate? I love my children, so I hate the things that threaten them. I love my wife, so I hate the things that threaten them. Sometimes they're conceptual, they're ideas, right, that can destroy them if they are embraced. I love what Pastor Scott Sauls has written. He says, if we love a particular person, place, or thing, we are always going to be angry at that which threatens the flourishing of that particular person, place, or thing. So what does Jesus say? Let's see it in verse 17. 
He who has an ear. So in other words, if you're willing to listen, listen. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, and he promises two things here. I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone. So that no, uh, a, a stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. What does that mean? What are these promises? Because, you know, they don't immediately leap out to us necessarily. Well, they're references to the Old Testament and ancient culture. Let's first deal with the hidden manna, because this is an awesome promise. This means that God, or Jesus in this case, will provide us with all that we need to live for him. The gods of Pergamum can, cannot. All that we need, all that we rely on, Jesus will provide. Manna was that bread that fell from the sky. It fell from heaven. Manna is just a Hebrew word that's kind of an expression that means, what is it? What is it? So one day the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness. They don't know where their next meal is going to come from. They come out of their tents and everywhere it had snowed bread. And they would say, manna, manna, what is it? And that became the name. It is what God himself can provide. And listen, there's great pressure. The, the, those Jesus followers at Pergamum, oh, just, just cave in. Worship Rome first, right? Just, just give him your due. Then you can do your Jesus thing. If, if you do that, your job will be good. You know, family should be good. Your income should be good. You'll get that promotion we might say today you want to get. So Jesus is saying, I'll provide for you what they won't. Just trust me. And then I love what he says next, the white stone. The white stone in ancient courts, a judge would issue a black stone to a defendant if he was found guilty, but a white stone if he was found innocent and was acquitted. And Jesus is saying, you, my Jesus followers, that, and you will prove that you have a genuine faith in me because you will hold on till the end and you have a white stone with your new name on it coming your way that means you're mine. The world's rejected you, but I haven't. What an encouragement for Jesus' followers then, and I hope an encouragement for you now. Um, I thought hard about the takeaway thought this week, and I just started listening to some music that puts my mind at ease sometimes, so I know this is how we're gonna close out our service today with a song from an old, old hymn. I think some of you will know it, and I think some of you will enjoy it for the first time if you haven't heard it. I'm going to make it my takeaway thought. You can have all this world. All this world with all of its promises, all of its phony, bogus allurements, all of its uh, uh, phony, bogus enticements, all of its over-promising and under-delivering. You can go that path. But in the midst of that, we hear the soft sound of sandaled feet walking among us. And we look up and there is Jesus saying, look to me. I love you. I died for your sins. I rose again to show you that I conquered everything that was ever arrayed against you. Sin, judgment, death, and hell. And you can have me if you want me. You can have all this world but give me Jesus. Father, thank you that you speak such a word of encouragement to a church that is always going to be pressured to cave, to give in, to declare other allegiances as more precious than Jesus. Lord, would you stoke the fire of faith in our hearts to hold fast to you and say, Everyone else can have what they want. I have to have Jesus. And may we spread that message around the world in his name. Amen.
Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. our prayer. So Lord, as we go this week, I pray that we would see all the beauty that you've made in this world, but we would know that that beauty that we see in this fallen world points to you, our true treasure, and that we would see we were made for greater beauty. Lord, I pray that we would love the people we come in contact with, we would give you thanks for your creation, but we would know we belong to another world because we belong to you, our great king. So, Lord, with that longing, help us to live lives that are well, lives that are pleasing to you, lives that point other people to you, our great treasure. We commit our week to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you go this week, I pray that uh, you would see with that lens that you would enjoy all the good gifts that God has given, but you would know that every gift points to a greater and more superior gift. Have an amazing week this week, and again, if we can help you and serve you in any way, please reach out to us at ChristFC.org. God bless. See you next Sunday.